Christopher Dunch is an impaired physician, a sociopath, and must be stopped from practicing medicine by the Texas Medical Board immediately. You're prepared to file a formal complaint? Absolutely. Yes. Well, we voiced our concern. We filed a complaint. They launched an investigation. What more would you like to do? I want to break his damn hands. Dr. Kirby, we have no choice but to respect the integrity of this process. Did you hear those goobers in there? The process is going to f*** us. The system is broken. And we are a part of that system. In the world of medical ethics, Dr. Randall Kirby was a beacon of integrity, famed for bringing down the notorious Dr. Death. His heroic story, played on screen by Christian Slater, captured the admiration of many. But today, the spotlight shifts to post-divorce proceedings, revealing a starkly different chapter in his life. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Uh, I am here with my client in my office. So okay. Here. Okay. When when it's his turn to speak, do you just want her to turn the camera on him? Well, yeah, well, what I'll do is I'll put it like this. So we're both here together. Okay, perfect. He's going to have to sit closer to me. <laughs> okay. We can be like this for a while too, but yeah, he's right here. Okay. All right. Miss Kirby, Mr. Kirby, good morning. Good morning. Rowan, good morning. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. And Blanca Espinosa isn't on this case, right? Not that I know of, Judge. Okay, let me check her in and see what she wants really quick. Let's see. All right, and is everyone ready to proceed? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And um, for clarification purposes, this is streaming live on YouTube to be in compliance with the Texas Open Courts Act. And the courtroom doors are also open as well. Miss Rohan, Ro, Rowan. Rowan. <laughs> Miss Rowan, this is your motion. Are you ready to begin? I am, Judge. Okay. Are there any preliminary matters I need to take up before we get started? I don't believe so, Judge. I intend to make a very brief opening statement since Your Honor already heard some argument from us uh, last week or the week before, oh, um, but I have no other preliminary matters. Okay, and let me get the timer. All right. Okay, we are on the record in calls number DF22. 04493 on a motion for enforcement and clarification. Councils, would you please state your name for the record? Rebecca Rowan for the petitioner, Dr. Judith Kirby. Lisa McKnight for respondent, Dr. Randall Kirby. Okay. Attorney Rowan, you filed this motion. You may proceed with your opening statement. Thank you, Judge. May it please the court. Uh, as you heard from us a couple of weeks ago, this is a petition for enforcement of property division as well as a request for clarification under Chapter 9 of the Texas Family Code. The parties had an agreed divorce decree entered by this court in November of 2022, ordering the husband, uh, Dr. Randall Kirby, to timely pay all of the party's 2021 personal tax liabilities. He's failed to do so resulting in egregious interest and penalties that are incurring, or excuse me, accruing every month and are continuing to accrue. Uh, you're gonna hear evidence today, Judge, that we have very real concerns about the respondent's burn rate and his spending habits. We do believe he has the funds to pay the remaining tax liability because you'll see evidence that in September of last year, he received over $650,000 from the sale of the marital residence. But despite having the funds to pay the taxes, we are very concerned about his uh, spending habits. So we are asking the court to enforce your own decree and order him to pay this debt. We're asking you to clarify that word timely and order it to be paid by time and date certain. Specifically, we're asking for you to order him to pay it by next Friday, April 4th, 2023. The short time frame is in direct response to the evidence you're gonna hear about our concerns about his spending habits. So that's the first thing we're asking you to do today, Judge. The second thing we're asking you to do is to order the respondent to uh, execute a release 
releasing my client from a business line of credit that in the divorce decree, he agreed to take that debt and indemnify my client. She's still on as a guarantor and a signer on that business line of credit. And we're asking him to simply sign a release that she can then provide to the bank to get her off of that line of credit. That's the second thing we're asking you to do today. The third thing that we're asking you to do is order attorney's fees to be paid by the respondent on behalf of my client because she had to file this lawsuit in the first place and bring it to the court's attention. And so you'll hear me testify in support of that request for attorney's fees. So it's very simple, Judge. And if I may share my screen, yes. I've uh, put together a summary of requested relief and hopefully you can see it at this point, Judge. What well, it's coming together, there it is. This is my summary of requested relief. It goes through the three things that we're asking you to do today, Judge. And so I provide this to the court for your, um, for your consideration and to the extent it helps the court. I've pre-marked it as P15 and I'm happy to offer it at this time. Any objection? Attorney McKnight, you're muted. I object insofar as we haven't started the hearing yet and this is opening. <laughs> okay, then I'll just wait, that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Judge. That's all I have for opening. You're welcome. Attorney McKnight? Yes, ma'am. Um, we had, I've looked at um, Ms. Rowan's requested relief today, and if she had started with that relief, that's some relief that we probably could have reached an agreement on. This is about a $5,000 enforcement case. That's it. And what she did was turn it into a nightmare at requesting relief that she's not entitled to. Um, if you, it's interesting that the relief she's wanting today is nothing like the temporary order and injunctive relief that she wanted um, in the past month. And so attorney's fees is an issue. I have filed and set today also a motion for Rule 13 sanctions, both against Dr. Kirby and her lawyer um, for pursuing this action. And so there's some facts that are going to come out. Um, uh, since the date of divorce, you'll learn that my client has paid well over a million dollars in community debts. Um, what there is a practice loan that is in both of their names that he's responsible for, that he's made payments for every single month. And there's approximately $180,000 owed on it. Um, what she wanted to do and what she asked and what we've had two hearings set on already is for him to have to put $400,000 into the registry of the court to cover the taxes that were owed, which were $175,000, and to cover this note, which is not due for $180,000. What you're going to learn is that there has been zero collection efforts on the part of the IRS or this practice loan. There was a million over, it's about $1.1 million in taxes that were due. He's paid all of them, except now that it, there's $175,000 that is due. After the divorce, he's remitted $200,000. It was it was three hundred and sixty five thousand was due at the time the parties the divorce decree was entered. Okay, now um, so what she came to court asking for was that he had to put four hundred thousand dollars into the registry of the court um, to try to collect two unsecured debts. Um, she's very focused on the proceeds of the house which he was awarded, um, and really what's the most a relevant factor here, Judge, is that we've had a hearing on this before. This was litigated. She filed a motion on, in the underlying divorce, had a hearing set in August on the issue of ordering the proceeds of the sale to be used to pay the IRS. That was a pleading. I have it. It's I, I'm going to ask the court to take judicial notice of it. It was set for a hearing and we reached an agreement that subsequently, and we proved it up on the record, that subsequently got entered in the final decree. That agreement awarded him the house unequivocally and ordered him to timely pay 
the, the taxes, okay? Now, um, so what we have, it's a tempest in teapot. The man had owed a $1.1 million in taxes and he now owes $160,000, $175,000 in taxes. She's repeatedly said, and it's factually incorrect, that there's $17,000 of penalties and interest accruing a month. That is not true. There is no document that she has that will demonstrate that. He will pay 100% of the taxes. Today is the first day I got this purported release that she wanted signed, which he signed it already. If she had sent me this in the beginning of the lawsuit, I would have happily signed the release. Okay, that's not what she wanted. She wanted to accelerate the $180,000 note, cram it down his throat, make him pay it off with the proceeds of the house, which she's not entitled to do. And now she's ab finally abandoned that uh, claim. She's after we've had two hearings on this already, after we had to brief it to the court. And so what turned what should be a $5,000 enforcement case, one motion, one hearing is now a $19,000 enforcement case and in a rule 13 sanctions. And so that's the issue is who's paying whose attorney's fees at the end of the day here. Um, what has been what's transpired is a travesty. She knows or should have known that's not appropriate relief to ask for. So the relief that we're having today is extremely watered down. It's basically and I don't disagree. So what she wants is for you to clarify when the tax when he has to pay the taxes, okay, and clarify the amount. That's going to be real easy. The amount's one hundred seventy five thousand dollars, and so you're going to either decide what you're going to decide when does he have to pay that. Our proposal is that the court set a um, report back in ninety days from today's date to um, see if he's complied with payment in full of the IRS taxes. Okay, the man has been paying taxes for all his life. He's never not paid the IRS. The relief she's wanting with respect to the um, other note, now it's just have him sign a release. Okay, done. We signed a release. It's basically the decree already released her from this, but that's not really what she wanted. What she wanted was you to force him to pay the whole note off. That's what she wanted. And that's and that's why she wanted you, you to order him to put 400 grand into the register of the court and not be able to spend any money on anything else until he paid that note and the IRS. That is so egregious as to rise to the level of Rule 13 sanctions. And that is also set before the court today. And um, that's those are the issues. Thank you. Judge, may I briefly respond since I'm the petitioner? Sure. Thank you. Um, first of all, I object. I, I did not see a notice of hearing for the motion for sanctions being set for today. Ms. McKnight, if I'm incorrect and it's out there, please point it out to me and I'll certainly look for it. Um, but I'll cite my objection to that going forward if it's not properly set. I take serious issue, Judge, with this allegation that I have somehow abandoned certain requests, that I have somehow watered down certain requests. Judge, I beg you, go look at my petition for enforcement that I filed in January on this case. I asked for at final trial, which is where we are, this is final trial, I asked for him to sign a release to enforce the tax debt and order it to be paid by a time and date certain. Those are the same requests I pled for and I'm asking you to do it today. Now, completely separate and apart from that, I had a request for temporary orders and temporary injunctions. That was set before Judge Lee. We presented arguments on it. She indicated to us that she thought both sides had merit to the argument. And then we presented some of those arguments to you a couple of weeks ago. That is a completely separate and, a, and different issue that is a temporary orders request. So if, if somehow Ms. McKnight is trying to put those together and say, I'm abandoning claims and I'm watering down claims, that's not true. Those were my temporary orders requests. Today, we're set for final trial. So this is what I'm asking you to do. I find it really interesting that for the first time I'm hearing, we probably could have agreed to this. This was in my petition from day one, from January. If we could have agreed to these things that I'm asking you to do today, it certainly would have been helpful to hear that 
back in January and February when I first filed this petition and Miss McKnight had a copy of it. So to the extent she's now saying, oh, all my requests today are so reasonable and she would have agreed to it, then what are we doing here? Why couldn't we have settled that if she would have come forward to me and told me that? But be that as it may, I just wanted to clarify those particular points. I also take issue with the fact that Ms. McKnight is telling you what I was requesting and why I was requesting it. In my initial petition, I requested $400,000 to be put into the registry of the court because that was the total tax debt owing at that time. And then subsequent to my filing the petition, the respondent paid a $200,000 payment to the IRS. So it went from a $400,000 approximate tax debt number to about $175,000. And that's the number I'm requesting today. I was never asking you to put $400,000 into the registry of the court to be both the, the line of credit money and the tax debt. I was concentrating on the tax debt because that's the thing that's improving interest and penalties. So I just wanted to clarify that for the court. I think that was everything that I wanted to say, Judge, and I'm happy to call my first witness. Okay, thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Oh, and Judge, on the issue of notice with respect to my sanctions, Ms. Oh. Roman, I have proof of service where you opened it on 324. Okay, I'll go look at my emails. Okay. Attorney McKnight, I was just getting ready to mention that. Um, okay. Ms. Rowan, it is on file with the court. It was filed March 24th at 446 p.m. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Judge. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, and I'll call the petitioner, Dr. Judith Kirby. Okay, let me swear in both parties. Would you both, Ms. Kirby, Mr. Kirby, would you both raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give will be the truth and the whole truth? I do. Okay, say it again with the microphone. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You may lower your hands and attorney Rowan, you may proceed. Thank you. Will you please state your name, ma'am? Judith Kirby. And where do you reside? Dallas, Texas. What do you do for a living? I'm an eye surgeon and uh, uh, ophthalmologist. Do you own your own medical practice? Yes, ma'am. And are you the petitioner in this case? Yes, ma'am. Judge, permission to share my screen? Yes. And both um, attorneys, you can share your screen as necessary. You don't have to ask. Okay. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Kirby, can you see the summary of requested relief in front of you? Yes, ma'am. And does this accurately summarize what you're asking the court to do today? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll offer P15. Any objection? No objection. All right. Petitioner is 15 is admitted. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kirby, can you see petitioner's exhibit one in front of you now? Yes, ma'am. Is this a true and correct copy of the agreed final decree of divorce relating to your marriage to Dr. Randall Carby. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll offer P1. Any objection? All right, P1 is admitted. Dr. Kirby, I'm gonna direct your attention to page 10. And on page 10, is there a section entitled liability for federal income taxes for prior year? Yes, ma'am. And I'm gonna highlight a section and read it. Let me know if I read it correctly. It is ordered and decreed that Randall Parker Kirby shall be solely responsible for all federal income tax liabilities of the parties allocable to December 31st, 2021, as reflected in the 2021-1040 joint tax return and shall timely pay any taxes, penalties and interest due thereon and shall indemnify and hold you and your property harmless therefrom. Did I read that portion of the sentence correctly? Yes, ma'am. And so based on your understanding, who was supposed to pay the party's federal income tax liabilities for 2021? Randall Kirby. Okay. And what date uh, did you all get divorced? Uh, the technical date was August 23rd, 2022. And it was signed by the judge on November 1st, 2022. Okay. Uh, what does your ex-husband do for a living? He's a vascular and general surgeon. And does he own his own medical practice? Yes, ma'am. And to the best of your knowledge and recollection, approximately how much uh, income does he bring in each year? Uh, as of uh, through July of 20, through December of 2022, he was bringing in anywhere from uh, about $3 million a year on average. Okay. Um, I'm gonna show you, ma'am, 
what I've pre-marked as petitioner's exhibit four. Can you see that on your screen? Yes, ma'am. And is petitioner's exhibit four a true and correct copy of you and the respondent's 2021 federal income tax return? And I'll yes, kind of scroll through it so you can see it. Yes, ma'am. I'll offer P4. Objection. Um, unless, unless, are those, are my client's social security numbers redacted? I think this is the redacted version. Yeah, it is. Okay. I have no objection as redacted. All right. P4 is in meeting. And on P4, uh, Dr. Kirby, can you see here, uh, on the form 8879, how much does the 2021 tax return reflect that you and Dr. Kirby owed? Sorry, I highlighted too much there. No, I can't see because the pictures are on the side of the computer. <laughs> see if you can drag the picture over a little bit maybe, or I'll have Amy come in there and help. Oh, there you go. Okay, yes, I have it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. And so how I'm much sorry. does that text, does P4 reflect that you all owed for 2021? As of the end of December 31st, 2021, the tax owed was $343,732. Thank you. And do you recall when was that tax return filed? That was filed October 17th of 2022. Under the terms of your final decree of divorce, who was awarded the marital residence? Randall Kirby. And the day after your divorce, did uh, Mr. Kirby receive a purchase offer for the house? He did. And did he accept that to the best of your knowledge? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you what I've marked yes. as petitioner's exhibit two and ask you if you can identify that as the settlement statement related to the sale of the marital, re marital residence. Yes, ma'am. I'll offer P2. Objection to the relevance. Well, Judge, part of my petition here is that he not only had the obligation to pay, but he had the ability to pay. So certainly the fact that he received $650,000 uh, in September of 2022 is relevant to whether he could have paid the tax debt in October of 2022. And I'm so sorry, Judge, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Overrule. Um, is P2 ex admitted? Yes. P2 Thank is you. Um, And so, mm, Dr. Kirby, on P2, what does it reflect? I've highlighted it on line 10. How much of the proceeds from the sale of the marital home went to Dr. Kirby? $654,248.06. Okay. And this also reflects that the closing date on the sale of the house was September 30th of 2022? That is correct. Yes, ma'am. So about two weeks before the taxes were due. Is that right? That's correct. To the best of your knowledge, sitting here today, has your ex-husband paid all of the 2021 tax debt uh, that we saw reflected on P4? He has not. Did you start receiving notices from the IRS related to that unpaid tax debt? Yes, ma'am. And I'm gonna show you on my screen what I've pre-marked as petitioner's exhibit three and ask you if you can identify this as a copy of a uh, notice from the IRS dated November 14th, 2022. Yes, ma'am. I'll offer P3. No objection. P3 is admitted. So on P3, Dr. Kirby, does it reflect how much is now due to the IRS on November 30th of 2022? Yes, ma'am. And I highlighted that number there, $365,000 and change? Yes, ma'am. And if we go to page two of Petitioner's Exhibit 3, is there a section that reflects penalties as well as interest? Yes, ma'am. And if we look at the line that says total penalties monthly plus daily, does it total $16,179.60? Yes, ma'am. And that's a combination of monthly and daily penalties. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Um, going down below that, the interest section, does it also reflect that interest had been accrued at that point of over $9,700? That's correct. Now, what is your understanding of whether you are jointly and severally liable on this tax debt, even though your ex-husband had been ordered to pay it? Objection to her, objection to her understanding. Judge, she can testify of her understanding. The relevance of her understanding. Okay, overruled. Go ahead, Dr. Kirby. It is my understanding that if Randall Kirby does not or cannot pay those federal income taxes, that the IRS will hold me responsible and can levy my assets and require me to pay it, regardless of the divorce decree, regardless of what the local divorce decree states. Okay. And is your understanding based also, I don't want to get into the details, but is it based also on um, your hiring and retaining a tax attorney? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to show you what I've marked as P5. And can you identify this, <clears throat> excuse me, as a transcript from the IRS dated 224 of this year, um, reflecting how much is still owed on that tax debt as of that date? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. I'll offer P5. Any objection? Not to P5. P5 is admitted. And so we can see here that accrued interest and penalties are continuing to accrue. I've highlighted that line. Do you see that there? Yes, ma'am. And that as of, let's see, it looks like as of 313, the debt was approximately $175,000. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, after you filed this petition for divorce, or excuse me, petition for enforcement, did Dr. Kirby, uh, the respondent, Dr. Kirby, did he make a payment to the IRS debt? Yes, ma'am. And approximately how much was that and when did he make it? $200,000 on January 4th. Okay. Um, can you tell the court how, well, let me back up, has the respondent's failure to pay the 2021 tax debt negatively impacted you and your medical practice? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you tell the court how? I've had to move offices and have had to um, pay a finish out fees, building construction fees of $1.1 million to have- Objection a to non-responsive um, is not responsive to how the taxes have anything to do with that? Yeah, she's getting there. I mean, can she be allowed to finish her sentence at least before there's an objection made? Yes, Attorney McKnight, allow her to finish the sentence and then you can make your objection at that point. Go ahead, Dr. Kirby. In order to come up with the money to pay the finish out, I had to approach a bank to try to get a loan and I was denied from getting a loan because I have personal Jackson, taxes due of 2021. Uh, Ms. Kirby, when an objection is made, and Mr. Kirby too, if you would just stop what you're saying, allow the attorney to make the objection, I'll rule on the objection, then your attorney will tell you whether or not you can continue with that question or you'll just stop and they'll ask another question, okay? Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Okay, let me scroll back up to the objection. Okay, the objection was to hearsay, is that correct, Attorney McKnight? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's overruled. So, so Dr. Kirby, just to summarize, you weren't able to get the loan because you didn't have your taxes paid for 2021. That's correct. What are you asking the court to do with regard to your ex-husband's failure to pay off the entire 2021 tax debt? I, I am begging the court to have those taxes paid off immediately because I cannot operate my business and maintain payroll for my 20 employees that I pay in order to sustain my practice. 
under the terms of your final decree, who was ordered to be responsible for all debts and liabilities associated with Dr. Randy Kirby's medical practice? Randy Kirby, Randall Kirby. And was he also ordered to indemnify you and hold you and your property harmless from any failure to pay those debts? Yes, ma'am. And is one of those debts uh, a business line of credit at PNC Bank that ends in account number 2142? Yes, ma'am. Um, and do you have reason to be concerned that your ex-husband has not always been current paying on that business line of credit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so did PNC Bank actually contact you regarding non Action leading and calling for hearsay? Sustain. Sustain is to leading. Sustain is to leading. Thank you. How did you become aware that, or what forms the basis of your belief that Dr. Kirby, Dr. Randall Kirby has not always been current on that business line of credit? In September or October, I don't remember the exact date, but the bank PNC called me to tell me that Objection Randall- that you're saying? Sustain. Um, Ms. Kirby, you can't say what someone else told you, okay? Yes, ma'am. What's the current balance, if you know, on that PNC business line of credit? I believe it is approximately $180,000. And are you tied to that line of credit somehow? Yes, ma'am. I'm a personal guarantor of that line of credit that had been signed and created in approximately 2002 or 2003. Okay. And based on uh, conversations with the bank, don't tell us what they said, but based on conversations with the bank, you have reason to believe he hasn't always been current on that line of credit. That is correct. Okay. Why are you asking the court to order your ex-husband to pay off that tax debt so quickly? Because I cannot access funds to, to maintain the practice and to grow the practice. But, but why can't we just give Dr. Kirby more time, Dr. Randall Kirby, more time to pay off those monies if he needs more time to do it? Because every day that goes by that he does not pay it is interest and penalties that are accrued to that tax balance. And I am potentially liable for that money if he cannot or will not pay it. Do you have any concerns about Dr. Randy Kirby's uh, spending habits and overspending habits? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell the court what those are? He currently rents a house that costs over $20,000 per month. Objection to, objection to relevance, objection to hearsay. What's the relevance, Attorney Rowan? Sure, Judge. So part of my requested relief and part of what I have to prove to you is that Dr. Kirby, Dr. Randall Kirby has the ability to pay. And in support of why I'm asking that the debt be paid so quickly, it goes to the relevance of that. Because if we are concerned that if he's given a lot of time to pay this thing off, like counsel wants 90 days or more, that the funds just aren't going to be there and he's not going to be able to do it. So it's absolutely relevant to the date by which I want him to pay. Objection overruled. Um, go ahead, um, ma'am. He, he leases two vehicles, each of which are value $180,000 each, each car. Um, he has approximately $250,000 at least of credit card debt. He's opened uh, an additional line of credit uh, for $250,000. Objection. Objection. May I take the witness on Bodar? Yes. Where did you get the information that he's opened an additional line of credit? I received the bank statement. Objection to hearsay. Sustained. Go ahead, Dr. Kirby. Is there any other reasons why you're concerned about um, Dr. Kirby, Dr. Randall Kirby's overspending or spending habits. He also maintains three country clubs, uh, all of which cost significant dollars per month. And his income has been decreased in the last six months. So in order for him to maintain the expensive house and the two 
vehicles and the three country clubs and the multiple credit card debts, he is using the money from the proceeds proceeds that of the house the speculation. Sustain. So, Dr. Kirby, um, why has your ex husband's income gone down in the last six months? If you know, he has been. Objection, judge. I'm going to object. And I'm going to put the witness on notice that he's violating my client's HIPAA rights. And I'm going to object to this line of questioning um, as it violates my client's right to privacy, his patient physician privilege. This is a doctor. She should know better. And I'm going to ask the court to instruct her not to bring it up again. Well, judge, the biggest exception to HIPAA is by court order. You can order her to answer those questions and she's not violating anyone's HIPAA rights. She testified that she believes his income has gone down in the last six months. I asked her, why does she believe that? And she can answer that question. That's not a violation of his HIPAA if you order her to answer that question. Well, it's going into a medical condition of his that she's aware of, and it's his private matter. This is on YouTube streaming live, and I'm going to object to this line of questioning as it as it violates his patient privilege rights. And and judge, if if we if the court is inclined to go into it, I have no problem coming off YouTube. I'm not trying to publicly broadcast it, but I think it's relevant to the inquiry here. Um, Attorney Rowan, I'm going back and I'm looking at your question. Your question was, so Dr. Kirby, why has your husband's income gone down in the last six months, if you know? Um, Ms. Kirby's response was, he has been then an objection was made. I, I guess for the court, what's the relevance to his income with uh, Mike and I'm putting everybody on notice including counsel not to violate my client's HIPAA rights this is pr protected under the federal law and under the state law and I'm putting everybody on notice including Dr. Kirby that his rights are being violated I object to this being broadcast I object to it being on the record and I object to it being disclosed in open court and judge, may I, I answer your, to move on. May I yes. answer your question, Judge? Yes, but only to the extent that the question was asked, the income relating. Understood. So we have a problem of income not meeting expenses. And that goes into why we are asking this debt to be paid and to be paid so quickly. So we've testified about all of his expenses and the overspending. But if all you heard is that he makes $3 million a year, then maybe you'd think, well, so be it. He can afford those things. That's his lifestyle. We have testimony and evidence to put forward that his income has gone down and the reasons why it's gone down. I understand the concern about it being broadcast on YouTube. I have no objection to it. Sorry, Miss Rivera. I have no objection to it coming off of YouTube. I'm not trying to publicly talk about anything on YouTube. However, it goes to that inquiry of the, the funds are going to be gone if you order this tax debt to be paid after 90 days. Okay. I believe that with, with everything that you presented thus far and probably information known to your client without going into that, the, the court believes from what I'm reading that that inquiry can still be made without going into the um, a, a, anything private dealing with Mr. Kirby. Okay. Can so I, I that you ask your next question? Sure. Dr. Kirby, if you can answer the question without going into private issues regarding your ex-husband's uh, private health information. Can you tell the court the basis of your belief that his income has gone down? And if you can't answer it that way, then just indicate that. Yes, ma'am. He did not work, no work whatsoever from December 2020 through February of 2021. And in addition, did not work with no income generating from November 2021 through April of 2022. And since uh, May of 2022, the income that has been generated is significantly less. Objection. And at this point, I'd like to take the witness on Voidar. You may proceed. Ma'am, do you have personal income, uh, personal knowledge of his income from May of 2022 until the present? Yes, ma'am. And how do you know what he's making now? I, I am uh, uh, on the banks, the, um, inter the uh, bank um statements online 
Are you looking, are you accessing his account that you're not uh, entitled to have access to? I, it, it is on my login. I, I don't, I can't remove anything. So your, your testimony that you're about to give is as a result of you accessing bank accounts that you are not awarded and that are not in your name? I'm going to object to multifarious. And I'm going to object as the- Hold on, one, one objection at a time. The objection to multifarious is sustained. One question at a time, Attorney McKnight. And I'm going to object to this witness testifying to any um, income that she lacks personal knowledge of, and it's particularly about anything that she's illegally accessing um, without consent. Um, and also it's speculation on her part, what's income and what's not. And I'm gonna object on that ground. May I respond very briefly, Judge? Very briefly, yes. The question was about from May 22 forward. These people weren't even divorced until November of 2022. I think she has the right to answer this question. If she, if she knows. Okay. Miss Attorney McKnight, did you want to re-ask Miss Kirby if she knows this information yeah. or not? So other than accessing his bank account, do you have personal knowledge of what his income is since the since August of 2022? You asked me the question since May of 2022. And so now I'm asking you since the date of divorce. August of 2022 to the present, do you have personal knowledge of what his income is? I have knowledge only of what has come into the bank because I am still a signer on that bank account and I'm still a signer on the line of credit. And that is why it is still on my login. That is why I have access to it. And so you've been accessing his bank account is the bank account that's awarded to him? I have not been removed as a signer on anything. And aren't you the one that has to execute the documents to remove yourself from that account? Your Honor, I'm going to object to relevance at this right. point. I mean, there's right. and I'm going to object right. to on, this. One second, one second. Hold on. Three things. Um, Attorney McKnight, I can hear your client in the background. I know you probably don't want everyone on the Zoom to hear what you all are speaking about. So, you know, maybe just press mute so we wouldn't hear what he says. And Attorney Rowan, Attorney McKnight, we have to have a clean record. My court reporter over here, you you guys are tearing her up. She can't write what everyone is saying at one time. So I'm going back on the record. Um, well, I've been on the record. I'm going back to the line of questioning that we have here. I believe... The question was specifically asking about August of 22 until the present time, whether or not Ms. Kirby knew that information. The court is going to go ahead and su sustain the objection as to speculation. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Well, I'm sorry. Let me let me back up real quick. Um, Dr. Kirby, was it necessary for you to retain my services to represent you in this case? Yes, ma'am. And as part of that representation, did you have to incur attorney's fees for my time preparing for and attending the uh, prior hearings as well as today's hearing? Yes, ma'am. Have you had to retain the services of any other attorneys as it relates to this issue of the non-payment of the tax liabilities? Yes, ma'am. I've retained an, a tax attorney to defend me against the IRS. Okay. And what is that gentleman's name? Joel Crouch, C-R-O-U-C-H. And at this time, do you know approximately how much you've incurred with my firm? $20,000 to your firm. And how much to uh, Mr. Crouch? $13,000 so far. And are you asking the court to order uh, your ex-husband to pay your attorney's fees as it relates to you having to bring this petition for enforcement? Yes, ma'am. I'll pass the witness. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kirby, um, were you present and did you hear your lawyer say that she initially filed for $400,000 and then after she filed, he paid $200,000 to the IRS and therefore she was only seeking $200,000 in the registry of the court. Did you hear her say that? Yes, ma'am. And is that what you're saying to the court too? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm gonna show you what are, is your pleading that's filed in this case. 
platforms. And in your pleading that was filed, you asked for $400,000 to be deposited in the registry of the court, correct? Yes, ma'am. And would you agree with me that $400,000 is more than what was owed to the IRS and the line of credit combined? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Would you agree with me that the sum of $400,000 is more than the 175 owed to the IRS and the 180 on the line of credit combined? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, looking up here. All right. And so your 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 lawyer said that she wasn't trying to make the um, accelerate the note on the on the line of credit. But looking right here in your pleadings, you acknowledge that he paid two hundred thousand dollars to the IRS on January 4th of 2023, didn't you? Yes. So it's not true to say that that was something paid after you had to file the divorce, he I mean, the enforcement, that was paid before you filed the enforcement, correct? I'm not sure I quite understand what you're well, asking. Well, if your attorney suggested to the court that it wasn't until after you filed your enforcement that he paid 200,000 to the IRS. Did you hear that? Yes, but I'm not exactly sure that the timing of when we initially filed for the enforcement relative to the January 4th date. Well, it says it in your pleading that he paid it, right? Yes, ma'am. But when I initially. And, and in, in the pleading, the same pleading, it says make him pay 400000 in the registry of the court, correct? Yes, ma'am. And in your pleading, you wanted him not to be able to spend any money whatsoever from any source until he paid the line of credit in full and until he paid the IRS in full. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to look, um, is it true that since the date of divorce, um, Mr. Kirby, so we, we've established that since the date of the divorce, he paid 200000 to the IRS, correct? Yes. All right. Now, looking at your exhibit number four, the tax return, I'm going to show you what's been already offered into evidence. Um, this is a letter Dated. When is this letter from your accountant firm dated? January 19th, 2020. Okay. That's this year, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so you and he got these tax returns in January of this year, correct? That is not correct. Okay. Well, um, and this is when you this is when we found out how much was owed. To, isn't this when we actually found out how much was owed to the IRS? No, ma'am, that is not correct. Okay. Well, this is what the date of the letter is from your accountant in closing the tax returns, correct? That is the date of when they sent the copies of the, of the paper copies, but that is not the date on which we knew how much taxes were owed. All right. And um, in your pleadings, you say the taxes were due on April the 15th, correct? April the 15th of 2022. Two. All right. And is it true that the, you filed an extension at that time? Yes, ma'am. And the taxes weren't filed until late, correct? Or they were filed in October of 2022? The filing was done in October of 2022, not that okay. when the taxes are due. Okay. So um, at and so in August, when we proved up the case, the tax return had not even been filed yet. Is that correct? That is correct. And do you remember coming to court um, in August and I was there and your attorney was there, your other attorney was there and Dr. Kirby was there? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember that you were asking for the specific release that the proceeds from the sale of the house must go to pay the taxes at that time? Judge, I'm going to object as to relevance. I don't know why we're talking about things that go behind the order that go behind the divorce decree. Sustain. All right. Now, um, the issue about whether or not, so these the proceeds of the house, those are not secured. Nothing is secured by those proceeds, is it, in the divorce decree? No. Other than the house mortgage. All right. So I'm going to show you what's already in evidence in your exhibit. 
um, of your P number two, the proceeds from the sale of the house. I'm going to ask you to look here at line 11. Yes, ma'am. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. All right. And um, do you remember at the time of the house sale that there was an unsecured note with PNC for $725,000? Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember that you would not cooperate with the sale of the house until I'm that, gonna, unless that note was paid in full? I'm going to object to going behind the prior order, going behind the final decree. There's absolutely no reason for it, Judge. And, and it's inappropriate. It's getting into parole evidence. It, it, the document speaks for itself. The decree says what it says. This is after the decree. This is after the divorce was rendered. You're asking about things she agreed or didn't agree to in, in negotiation of the divorce decree. No, I'm telling her. I'm asking her. That's not what I'm asking. One, one moment. One moment. Do not address each other. Do not address each other. The Anything going behind the order is not going to be considered and is not proper before the court. So anything behind the order that is being asked is sustained. Anything that is after the order, Attorney McKnight, you are free to ask those questions. Okay. Now, after the divorce was rendered and granted, um, the house sold. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you remember that at the time the house sold, after the divorce was rendered, there was a 725,000 unsecured note to PNC. Yes, ma'am. All right. And is it true that you insisted that that entire note, and you were an obligor on that note, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that was a note that Dr. Kirby was ordered to pay, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you would not go through the sale of the house unless that note was paid in full, would you? Your Honor, I, I'm going to object again, and I'm, I'm sorry. I understand she's asking about something that haf happened after rendering, but the decree hadn't been signed at that point. So I, I'm still going to object, and also relevance. Well, it goes to the issue of what she's trying, what she's already done is what she's trying to do again, which is accelerate an undue note and force him to pay it from proceeds. That's exactly what she did on the sale of the house. It's what she was trying to get Judge Lee to do and you to do on a temporary hearing. And it's the same type of behavior that I'm talking about. She did it with the proceeds, causing him to have to pay off a $725,000 note that was not due. I'll allow it. Um, <clears throat> I'll allow it. Okay. But, but Judge, she's talking about things that happened at a temporary orders hearing in the divorce. That's that goes to attorney's fees. Going behind the prior order. And, and the issue here is two different things going on here. Um, you're proving your case in terms of the enforcement and the clarification, as well as your attorney's fees. And attorney May Knight is also asking questions that I believe are relevant to her motion that is set for today on the sanctions. So that's why I'm, I'm not allowing anything in terms of something that goes behind the previous order. I mean, the current order. But anything that's specifically related to behavior, which is what it looks like she's talking about here, then I will allow it for the sake of her testimony for her particular motion for sanctions. So, Dr. Kirby, so if you hadn't insisted on seven hundred twenty five thousand um, dollars from his from his house be paid for the joint debt, he would have had more money to pay the IRS at the sale of the house. Would you agree to that? I object to speculation. Sustain. Now, is it true that um, since the date of the divorce, Dr. Kirby has paid $80,000 to Lake Forest for college expenses for your daughter? I object to relevance, Judge. Sustain. It's going, he, she wants to talk about his country clubs. He's been having to support their children's adult daughters and he's, done that. So that's what I'm counteracting. Is, I ask your next question. All right. Is it true that he's paid for your son's college expenses at Texas A&M since the divorce? Relevance. Sustain. Is it true that since the divorce was signed, he's paid the minimum amount due on the PNC business line of credit? That is not true. Okay. Well, is it, has he paid every single month? That is not true. Okay, so what month did he not pay? In in August and September, he had not paid. Okay, and so the divorce decree was signed when? August 23rd. That's when you think that's when the divorce decree was signed? 
by the judge, it was signed on November 1st. Okay. But, but the parties, to my understanding, was August 23rd, 2022. All right. And so since November 1st of 2022, has the minimum payment been made every single month to the PNC line of credit? Yes. All right. And so has that note been accelerated by PNC? No. Were you trying to get the court to order him to put money from the sale of his house into the registry of the court to make him pay that note off? By prime objection, and it calls for a yes or no. Were you trying to do that? Can she, Judge, can she just try to answer the question before we get an objection? It was non responsive. Yeah. Attorney McKnight, your objection, the record doesn't clearly show it out fully and allow her to answer the question. My goal was to have my name removed as a personal guarantor from that note. All right. So do you think that Dr. Kirby can force PNC Bank to remove you as a personal guarantor? Yes. Okay. And what, what do you what do you think? He can do? One, second, one second. Let me make sure I rule on the objection. The objection to speculation is sustained. All right. <clears throat> So do you think Dr. Kirby signing a release him on his own is going to have PNC remove you from that loan? That is my understanding. Okay. When was the first time you ever sent over the release that you wanted signed? Was it today? I, I don't know. Okay. Throughout the pending of this whole litigation, um, you didn't, You'd never signed a release that you wanted him to sign, sent a release that you wanted him to sign, did you? Object to an asked and answered. She says she doesn't know. Sustain. All right. Now, has the IRS sent any notice of lien to you? No. Has the IRS sent you a demand letter? No. Has the IRS um, garnished any of your property or wages? Not yet. All right. Have you had any notice of levy or any collection efforts whatsoever from the IRS? Not yet. Okay. Has PNC sent you any demand letters? No. Has PNC sent you any collection letters? They have called. They had called. Objection me. to a non-responsive answer. Objection sustained. Miss Kirby, it was a yes or no answer. I'm sorry. No. Has PNC dinged your credit, put any negative credit reporting on you? Yes. Oh, did you bring proof of that today? No. Do you know, why would they put negative reporting on you and not put negative reporting on Dr. Kirby? I'm going to object to assume as facts not in evidence. Sustain. Have you seen a negative credit reporting by PNC on you? Yes. And what, in what context? Where did you see that? From late payments from August and September. Objection to non-responsive answer. The question was, where did you see it? The objection is sustained. Where did you see it? On on a credit report. Okay. When did you? When's the last you saw? When? Why didn't you produce your negative credit reporting to show the judge how Dr. Kirby's ruining your credit? I wasn't asked to. Now, we were at a temporary hearing in front of Judge Lee. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And it was in late February. Do you recall? Yes, ma'am. And I asked Judge Lee that she set this matter for final hearing. Do you recall that? Yes, ma'am. And Judge Lee offered us this March 28th court date. Do you recall that? Yes, ma'am. And um, you specifically, you, the client, said no, you wanted to have a temporary hearing. Do you remember? Yes, ma'am. And so we had to come back to court on March 14th for another temporary, another stab at a temporary hearing on your part. Do you recall that? Yes, ma'am. And because you, of these pleadings that you filed, we had to draft a brief to the judge on why, whether it's appropriate for what you were asking. Do you remember that? Honor, yes, I'm going to object to the extent it calls for a legal conclusion and speculation as to why the court requested briefing. Sustain to 
the legal conclusion? So you had an opportunity in February 28th to set this matter for trial on March 28th, but you wanted to come back down here to try to have an injunction and order him to put money into the registry of the court. Isn't that correct? Yes, ma'am. The multifarious. Attorney McKnight, reminder, one question at a time. Despite being able to come into court in less than 30 days, you insisted on yet another hearing to try to make him put money in the register of the court, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this is something, this is something that you tried to have done in the underlying divorce um, repeatedly, isn't it? Objection to going behind the pri the current order. The same. Now, um, ma'am, you are not being charged $17,000 a month in penalties and interest by the IRS, are you? I am. You That's what you think, that you're being charged $17,000 a month? According to that notice, it listed penalties and interest. I, I don't have the, the notice in front of me of uh, many thousands of dollars per month. That's what, according to the IRS notice that was exhibited, already submitted for exhibit. Isn't it true that you were responsible for the withholding and prepayments to the IRS for the tax year 2021? I'm going to object to relevance, Judge. Well, the, relevance? the relevance is going to be there was $17,000 worth of taxes and penalties at the time of the filing. It was due to her underpayment, not due to his failure to pay. And then she's conflated that somehow into seventeen thousand a month, and that's what the point I'm going to get to. And I renew my objection to relevancy. It doesn't matter how the tax debt came about; the tax debt is here. It's jointly and severally. It's a tax debt. I'll, I will sustain the objection. There was seventeen thousand dollars of taxes, of penalties, and interest at the time the tax return was filed and it lists that in the tax return. Would you agree with that? Yes, ma'am. All right, and that was, and so you're not blaming that on Dr. Kirby, are you? I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, the $17,000 that was due at the time it was filed, that's not his fault, is it? Yes, ma'am. That's his fault, yes, the 17,000 that was passed due. Yes, and you said that he's the, he was out of, he wasn't working for a period of six months, isn't that correct? Yes, ma'am. And during that six months period, you spent up all of his receivables, didn't you? Paying bills. Okay. And so doctors have a six to nine month in receivables collection rate. Would you agree with that? Yes, ma'am. And so during the divorce, you spent up all his receivables and now he's trying to build his receivables back from a period of unemployment, isn't he? I'm going to object to the extent it's going behind the current order. It sounds like she's asking about things that happened during the pendency of the divorce. Well, the question, talk, the period of unemployment, was that after the that divorce? Was, that was during the divorce. So she spent up all his receivables while he was unemployed, and now okay. he's building them back up, which is why he needs time. I got it. Sustain. Okay. Now, um, you have tried to extort Dr. Kirby um, in this case, haven't you? I'm going to object, Judge, to argumentative. I'll Sustain. rephrase. Did you contact his sister and tell him, boy, he better pay this or I, all his business is going to be public? I'm going to object it's gonna to be relevance. All, it's going to be public and everybody's going to know. I'm going to object to relevance. Objection is sustained. Did you threaten him that you were going to disclose his private inform medical information if he didn't pay this? I'm going to object to relevance. What's the relevance, Attorney McKnight? It goes to attorney's fees and her, and what she and the fact that she tried to leverage something that she couldn't do and hold up his medical condition over his head to extort him. That has nothing to do with the request for attorney's fees, Judge. The Spain. Ma'am, the reason you can't get a loan has to do with your income. Would you agree with that or no. lack thereof? 
No, ma'am. Not this 165,000 that's due to the IRS? No, ma'am. Pass a witness. Very briefly. Very briefly for the court, I would like to give my court reporter a potty break and I would like to do the same for you all. So um, the court is in recess. We'll do five minutes because I know we need to get to Attorney McKnight's side, okay? So we'll be back um, on the record at 10.09. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Okay. I don't know if you all know we're getting ready for the AV equipment training this afternoon. So, okay, and we are back on the record. Attorney Rowan, you were getting ready to redirect your client? Yes, I just had a couple follow ups. I'm not sure why her video is not on. Do you mind seeing real quick? My associate's in here with me. I'm going to see if she can help her with the video real quick. Sorry. No problem. And you might hear everybody. I just don't see my video. Okay, let us figure it out. Sometimes on the top, you just slide like where the camera is. Maybe she did that. Um. Brenda? Sometimes it helps too if you log out and then try to log back in. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. No worries at all. Okay, there is Attorney McKnight. Attorney Rowan, you may begin. Thank you, Judge. Um, Dr. Kirby, there was some testimony about that $725,000 debt that was paid out of the funds from the house sale. What was the nature of that debt? Objection to the relevance. What is the relevance, Attorney Rowan? I don't think it's particularly relevant either, but to the extent Miss McKnight got to question my client about it and some of that testimony came in. I just wanted to clarify what that loan was. But if the court doesn't think it's relevant, neither do I. Well, Attorney McKnight, you did open the door, so I'll allow it. The objection is overruled. Go ahead, Dr. Kirby. What was the nature of that uh, $725,000 loan? Are you asking me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. It was, uh, it was a loan used for uh, a line of credit, an unsecured line of credit for the construction, the remodeling of the house. And was that line of credit in your name as well as your husband's? Yes, ma'am. And is that why you wanted it paid off from the sale of the house? Yes, ma'am. Now, there was some testimony and some questions um, Ms. McKnight asked you about why you wanted a temporary orders hearing so, so desperately in this case. Can you tell the court why that was so important to you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, because I know the spending habits of Randall Kirby, and I know that he had not worked for three months, December 20th to February 2021, and November 21 to April of 2022. There, uh, the income, my expectation is that he would have a suffer a decline in income, and his expenses were grossly in excess of, of money that he could bring in to meet that expenses. And so my concern was, is that he would, he would use the money from the proceeds of the house to maintain a lifestyle and then not be able to pay the taxes. And then the IRS would come after me 
because I'm jointly and severally liable for those taxes. And they would come after my practice and my ability to pay 20 employees, most of whom are single mothers, uh, to, to work for me. And uh, and I and I would have nothing. I, I had already given him the house. I had already given him everything. And so is it your opinion that your ex-husband- Objection had- to leading. Sustain, don't lead. Didn't even get to finish my question. I didn't, you didn't have to. Is it your opinion that is leading? Attorney McKnight, Attorney McKnight, we've already established that it's inappropriate for the two of you to speak to each other. Um, Dr. Kirby, do you have a concern that your ex-husband has a pattern of non-payment of obligations? Objection to leading. That's not a leading question. It's a, do you have a concern? Yes. Overruled, Attorney Rowan, uh, I mean, not Attorney Rowan, strike that. Ms. Kirby, what was your answer? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I sure can. Do you have a concern that your ex-husband has a pattern of non-payment of his obligations? Yes, ma'am. And what is what forms the basis of that opinion? That while he was uh, not working, um, I had used the, his receivables to pay the mortgage on the house and to pay expenses for the house, he refused to to sell one of his two. I'm going to object. At, I'm going to object as a going behind the decree. Sustain. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. All right. Miss, Miss, do you think that you should have any more rights than any other person suing for an enforcement in Dallas County or in the state of Texas? I'm going to object. It calls for a legal conclusion. Sustain. You don't know, you have no personal knowledge of whether Randy Kirby has been working daily in hospitals since the date of divorce, do you? No. And so everything that you're doing is based on fear and speculation and what he may or may not be doing, correct? No. You don't, and you really don't know how much income he's making right now, do you? Not precisely. That's the witness. I have nothing further of this witness, Judge. Okay, this witness is excused. Attorney Rowan, you may call your next witness. Thank you. I'll call the respondent, Dr. Randall Kirby. Okay. Will you please state your name for the record, sir? Randall Parker Kirby. And you're the respondent in this matter, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And in September of 2022, you received over $650,000 in proceeds from the sale of the marital residence. Is that correct? You've shown that today. And and so that's correct? You've shown that today. One second, Attorney Rowan. Mr. Kirby, that's inappropriate. You have to answer either a yes or a no, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And make sure you speak clear. Um, Attorney McKnight, you may want to switch where he's a little closer yeah. to here. Yes, that way my court reporter can hear his responses. Okay, Attorney Rowan, for, for record purposes, would you mind repeating your question, please? I'm happy to, Judge. Um, sir, in September of 2022, you received over $650,000 from the sale of the marital residence. Isn't that correct? Yes. And how much of those $650,000 do you have left in your possession? Over half. Okay. And are those funds held uh, in your personal account or your PA account? Uh, They're held in a business and in a personal account. Yes, ma'am. How much total is in your personal account right now, if you know? I don't know. Can you approximate? Uh, about $50,000. And how much is in your PA account right now, if you know, or an approximation? I can't approximate, but it's over, it's between three and $400,000. Okay. And your PA, you 100% own it. You're the sole owner of that PA. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now you do agree that in your 2021, uh, excuse me, you do agree that in your final decree of divorce, you were ordered to pay all of the 2021 taxes plus penalties and interest, correct? 
Yes. And you actually agreed to that, did you not? Yes. Okay. And were you aware that those taxes, penalties, and interests were due on or about April 15th of 2022? No. When did you think they were due? Judy and I have been paying taxes late since we've been in practice and not since 1996. We've Objection, been non-responsive. Well, you asked. Sustain. Sustain. So when did you think the 2021 federal income tax liabilities were due if you didn't think they were due on April 15th of 2022? Sometime this winter or, or spring of okay. 2023. And you have not paid them in full, even by your own uh, deadline of winter or spring, correct? I met with my accountants in late January, and I owed one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Responsive, sustained, Mr. Kirby. If you just answer the question that is asked, this will go a lot smoother. Do you need me to repeat the question, sir? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So even by your own deadline that you thought it was winter or spring when they were due, you have not paid 100% of those tax liabilities, have you? The deadline's not due, and so no. Objection, non-responsive, other than no. The objection to non-responsive, other than no, is sustained. And that liability is accruing interest and penalties, correct? Yes. And it's accruing those interests and penalties every month and every day. Isn't that correct? Yes. So certainly it's a past due debt if it's accruing interest and penalties, right? Yes. Okay. And you agree that as of March of this year, the amount that you still owe to the IRS exceeded $175,000, right? No. And you do agree that penalties and interests are going to continue to accrue until you pay it off, right? Yes, I've asked my accountants to, to ask for a payment plan from the IRS. Objection, non-responsive, other than yes. The objection to non-responsive, other than yes, is sustained. Okay. And isn't it true, sir, that at least on one occasion in the last year, you were also late or did not pay a payment associated with your business line of credit at PNC Bank? No, that payment came due on the weekend and I paid it the minute they notified me, which was within 48 hours. Objection, non-responsive, other than no. Other than no, the objection is sustained. So just so your testimony is clear, you agree with me that on at least one occasion in the last year, you did not timely pay a debt associated with that business line of credit. I could not make the payment because they asked for the payment on the weekend and PNC was closed on the weekend. Objection, non-responsive, Judge. Sustain. Isn't it true, sir, that you haven't had contact with your so-called accountant since January of this year? No. When was the last time you contacted them? In February of 2023. Isn't it true, sir, that you spend over $20,000 a month on your rent home? No. Okay, how much do you spend on your rent home? Uh, 18. Objection to the relevance? Yeah. What's the relevance, Attorney Rowan? Judge, it's absolutely relevant as to why I want this debt paid next week and not in 90 days because his spending exceeds his income and there's no way he's going to have the funds if he has that much time. Overrule. Go ahead, sir. How much do you spend on your rent? You were saying 18000 18500 Okay, and the t value of your two motor vehicles exceed 350000 no. Do you have two motor vehicles in your possession? Yes. And how much are they worth approximately? Probably 220000 And you finance those, right? So you make payments on those every month? Lease payments. They're both financed through my business. Okay. And, and, you, all... pay for, excuse me, and you pay for three country club memberships every month? Yes. And okay. civic organizations. And... Your total credit card debt sitting here today is over 200000 Isn't that right? That's an accurate approximation. Okay. So you're sitting on over $300,000 in an account in which you control, and yet you haven't paid off 
the federal income tax liability that's past due. Is that right? Could you, could you repeat that question? Happy to do it. Sitting here today, you are sitting on an account that you solely control that has over $300,000 in it, and yet you haven't paid off the $175,000 that's due to the IRS and is unpaid and, uh, and past due. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Six spots with me, please. I got a. No, sorry. No worries. All right. All right. Um. All right, Dr. Kirby. Did you hear? Here, you. Let's do it this way. There we go. Did you hear um, Judith Kirby say that you went? Uh, that she spent up all your receivables. Yes. Object right. to the relevance, Judge. What? It's already evidence before the court. Attorney McKnight. What is the relevance of that question? Well, it's already evidence that's before the court. She admitted that she spent up all his receivables, and I'm getting to the point why he why he has to have three hundred thousand dollars in his bank. And I objected. He it up. I'm trying to defend the man. Yeah. And I objected to the line of inquiry the first time around. It's asking about things that happened during the pendency of the divorce as it relates to getting community bills paid. I don't see how it has any relevance to the petition for enforcement that's set today. Okay. Anything that goes behind the previous order, we're not going to entertain. So that objection is sustained. Attorney McKnight, I will allow you to go ahead and get to the point you were trying to make where you mentioned the $300,000. All right. Now, um, did you go through a period of um, where you were um, uh, on a medical leave from work? Yes. And how long was that? Five months. Okay. And... Um, so is there, does, as a doctor, um, did you hear her say it's about nine to six to nine months to get your receivables? Yes. All right. And is that true? Yes. All right. And do you work with receivables? Yes. And so, um, so there was income during that five months that you were on medical leave and that income was spent. I'm going to object to leading at this point, judge. Sustain, don't lead. Okay. Now, are you in a period of rebuilding your receivables? Yes. Okay. And um, does it take having capital in your account? Tell the court whether or not you need capital to operate a medical practice such as yours. I need capital in order to function and pay my employees and my rent for my office and my living expenses. Yes. All right. Are you able to pay off the IRS in full today? I prefer not to. Okay. Would it cause you to be in a cash? Would it affect your cash flow to maintaining your practice? It I'm going to object to leading. Okay. Sustain, don't lead. All right. What would that do to your cash flow in maintaining your practice? It would make things very, very difficult. All right. Now, um, did you pay a payment in January to the IRS? Yes. Okay. And um, did anybody have to sue you to do that? No. All right. You did that before they filed this lawsuit? Absolutely. Okay. Did they have to sue you to pay the rest of it? No. All right. Have you ever not paid your federal income taxes through the history of your life? Never. Okay. Have you Never. Ever? All right. And I've been um, working since I've been 16 years old. Objection to non responsive. No. Uh, the court will accept his answer is never. Everything else is um, the objection to non response to this thing. All right. Now, have you um, are have you been in contact with an accountant regarding the amount due and uh, with your IRS? Yes, constantly. Has the has the IRS taken any collection efforts towards you? Absolutely none. Have you received a demand letter? None. Have you seen the lien? No. Notice of past due taxes? None. A levy? No. Any collection efforts whatsoever? None. Okay. Now, um, uh, how much time, are you asking court to give you some time to pay it in full? Yes. Okay. And do um, and you think you can pay it at the rate of about fifty to $60,000 per month? Well, about one seventy five divided by three, how much ever that is, three months to get it paid in full? Yes. All right. Is that an, an, um, a, uh, an arrangement that the IRS could make with you? I'm going to object to speculation. I haven't asked the IRS 
for any payment plan. I was planning on paying. Mr. Kirby, Mr. Kirby, okay. there was an objection made and I sustained it. Okay. So, okay. All right. So what you, what was your plan? My plan was to pay $100,000 within the next 60 days and then pay the rest in 90, which would be about $65,000. Okay. Well, you know, it's $75,000 now. Yeah, I saw that. All right. Now, is it true that you're accruing $17,000 a month in late interest and late fees? No. All right. That's the total. All I'm right. going to object to non-responsive after no. Non-responsive after no is sustained. And are are you, is there any question in your mind that you're responsible for that? No. All right. And you're going to pay that? Yes. Okay. Now, um, PNC line of credit, what is that that she's suing you on? Well, this was a uh, practice loan that Judy took out years ago, actually to pay taxes. And we, we, she took this money and paid IRS taxes with it. It was supposed to be a practice loan for my business, but she ended up using the entire practice loan to pay taxes which I did not object to, and I'm making the payments and I'm responsible for that loan. And you can call, and All right. everything's up to date and we made a payment yesterday. I am just non-responsive at this point, narrative. Sustain as to non-responsive. Right. I'm gonna show you um, what's been marked as responsive specific number one and ask you if this is um, your history of payment with the practice loan that we produced in discovery. Yeah, payment was received. No, no, I'm just asking if yeah. that's what this is. Yes. All right, and um, is this a um, reflect the history of payments that you've made since the divorce, except for the March payment? Yeah. I would offer respondents exhibit number one. Objection? I don't have one. Um, do you, can you pull it up, Ms. McKnight? I'm sorry, I don't see it. Okay, now we see it. And Attorney McKnight, did you submit any exhibits to- Yes, ma'am. They were emailed. I don't know to whom. No, I, I did receive them. I was just, I didn't have them right in front of me. No, I have no objection to this exhibit. Okay. Respondents one is admitted. Ms. McKnight, Lisa, if you'll send those to me. Also, I didn't get them. But you I think you sent them to Destiny. Destiny. Okay, hold on. Let me put myself on mute. Yeah. The ones that are admitted, it's okay. When you have time after the hearing. Okay, they're on their way to you. All right, looking at respondents exhibit number one, Dr. Kirby, um, is this the history of payments since the date of the divorce? Uh, yes. Okay, and so you made a payment in November, December, January, and February, according to this exhibit. Yes, and yesterday. All right, and yesterday, March of 2027, you also made a payment. Yes. And how much did you pay then? Uh, $2,718 in some sense. All right, is the payment slightly going down? Yes. All right, and how much total is owed on this note? About $180,000. All right. And um, are you going to, is this note in any way been accelerated? No. Have you received any demand letters from this PNC? No. Um, are they, have they put any negative credit rating effect, uh, credit reporting they, on They you? have not reported anything to any major, um, what, any of the three credit agencies. I'm going to object to non-responsive. That's not the question. I'm going to object to non-responsive. Sustain. Attorney McKnight, did you want to re-ask your question to your client? Yeah. Have you gotten any negative or credit reporting? And have you checked? Well, first of all, have you checked? Yes. And have they put anything on your credit? No. And your name's on that loan? Yes. And how late were you one time on that loan? Three or four days at okay. most, at most. So is it is it a fair statement to say you were never more than 30 days late on that loan? Yes. All right. And um, and uh, <clears throat> tell the court why you have an objection to the acceleration of this loan. It's it does not need to happen. Okay. And and why were you objecting to that? You had to put four hundred thousand dollars into the registry of the court. Well, that's just outrageous. Okay. And um, has has anybody, and is this behavior new or is it a continuing pattern? No, this the, this occurred during the divorce, the separation and the divorce where Judy wanted things accelerated. I object to relevance delay. if we're going behind the, the current order. Objection sustained. We're not going behind the prior order. And um, 
at the time when you sold your house, um, did she interfere with that sale? She sure did. Okay. And did she do, did she cause you to have to pay um, an entire $725,000 loan? Yes. They loan PNC. Object to okay. relevance okay. and object to non-responsive at this point. Attorney McKnight, what's the relevance? So basically the same thing she tried to, she's trying to pull in this case, making him pay that whole 180 all up front is what she did when he tried to sell his house and she wouldn't sign the papers unless he paid off a $725,000 unsecured line of credit in full and he couldn't sell his house unless he did it. Right, and that's why it's relevant. Speaking of objections. I'm going to object to relevance. Okay. <laughs> to your next question all right now did you have to hire me to um sorry. Sorry. defend I'm you in this i'm going to sustain the objection okay, okay. I, I, I figured that yes all right now um do you now did you execute the release that she sent over yes okay did you have any problem in signing this release as it was drafted no is today the first day you saw the release yes okay um is uh do you think that you're signing the release is going to do anything to stop her being obligated on the note from pmt i object to speculation it's doubtful the same all right so you have no objection to the court ordering you to sign the release that you've already executed today no. right no. all right and you have no objection to the court clarifying the order that says you have to pay that line of credit ending in whatever it ends in correct yes all right, that's not even an issue, correct? Right. Did did she need to file a lawsuit to do that? No. We're going to object to speculation as well as calls for a legal conclusion. Sustain to it calls for a legal conclusion. Um, have you consistently paid that note when due? Yes. All right. And will you continue to do that? Yes. All right. And is there anything that the court can even do? besides making a finding that you owe that loan i'm going to object to calls for a legal conclusion sustain all right now are you asking so do you agree you agree that you owe the money that's passed due on the irs correct yes all right and you're asking the court to uh the court can clarify that and order you to pay it by date certain yes all right and are you asking that you have 90 days to come back and prove that you've paid it in full yes all right um, have you met your financial obligations in this case? I'm going to object calls for a, a legal conclusion. Sustain. All right. Is Judith Kirby or her property at any risk of um, at, for anything as it relates to this IRS debt? No. Judge, I'm going to object lack of personal knowledge. Sustain. Can um, I answer the question? No. Um, now, uh, has she tried to use your medical condition as a means of extorting you to force you to do something that you're not legally required to do? Objection She's leading, objection relevance. Yes. Sustain, sustain as to leading, don't lead. Attorney McKnight, you may re-ask, rephrase okay. the question. Um, now, has... In respect to the relief that she's requested in this case, has she tried to use your medical condition as any any threat um, to try to get you to do something that you're not legally required to do? Your Honor, yes. I'm going to object as to relevance. It doesn't have any relevance to what's set today. The same. Did she make good on a threat that she made to you? Here I'm is. going to object to relevance and also assumes facts, not in evidence. The same. Are you asking the court um, that she pay her own attorney's fees for this case? Yes. All right. And are you asking that she pay sanctions against for your attorney's fees? Absolutely. I'll pass the witness. Thank you. Very briefly, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Excuse me, Dr. Randall Kirby, I've pulled up your exhibit. It's loading right now. Should be there. Respondents Exhibit 1. Do you see it on the screen? Yes. And the reason, isn't it true, sir, the reason that your payment was double on November 28th, 2022 is because you were catching up on two payments. Isn't that right? No. Okay. But you did testify and admit that you were late on at least one payment. 
By a few days, yes. Objection, non-responsive, other than yes. Can I explain why it was doubled? Overrule, I'll accept his answer as by a few days, yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Kirby, isn't it true that the last time you were on medical leave was in May of 2022, almost a year ago? No. Okay. When was the last time you were on medical leave? April of 2022. Oh, okay. So definitely a year ago you were on medical leave. It was a year ago that you were on medical leave, correct? April 2022. Okay. And so you testified about how you need six to nine months to catch up on receivables, but the last time you were out on medical leave was a year ago. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. And you only have one employee you have to pay, right? Yes. Okay. So... You testified about how you need to hold on to that cash in your PA account, but your monthly expenses as it relates to your business are not that significant, are they? No, they are significant. You also testified just now with your attorney that you'd received no notices from the IRS about past due payments. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. Okay. But I'm showing you on the screen what's already in evidence, P3. You and my client both got this notice from the IRS in November talking about interest and penalties of $25,000. You got this, didn't you? Yeah, Judy went to the accountants and had it generated. Objection, non-responsive. Sustain after, anything after yeah is um, sustained as to non-responsive. Okay, so Dr. Kirby, P3 is a notice from the Department of Treasury Internal Revenue Service addressed to you and Judith Kirby, right? Yes. And you received it in or around November of 2022, correct? Yes. Okay, so that wasn't true what you told the judge just now on direct when you said you hadn't gotten any notices of past due. I guess, yes. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. All right. Attorney McKnight, redirect. I don't think I have no further questions with this witness. Okay. All Jen. right. And Attorney Rowan, um, may Mr. Kirby be excused? Yes, ma'am. I was just going to call myself on fees. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Judge. My name is Rebecca Rowan. I'm an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Texas since 2007. I've practiced family law exclusively since my investiture. I'm board certified in family law and have been since 2012. My billing rate as specified in my contract with my client is 475 an hour. My paralegal is 205 an hour because she's also board certified. I'm familiar with the fair and reasonable and usual and customary fees charged by family law attorneys in Dallas County, Texas, and it's my opinion but the attorney's fees incurred by my client pertaining to this lawsuit have been reasonable and necessary and reflect usual and customary fees charged for same or similar matters. Uh, it's a I summary have, of attorney's uh, fees and a summary exhibits, of my I'd testimony. Like to offer, and judge, offer and I'm going to pull them up on my screen. Um, I'm going to object to the first one is, is um, I don't believe the P10. underlying documents are admissible it's, and support those, those fees. And this is just a summary of my testimony, judge. Uh, overrule P. 10 is admitted as a summary. Thank you, Judge. The total attorney's fees and costs incurred by my client attributable to this lawsuit and preparing for and attending today's trial approximate uh, $20,642.62. The summary that's in front of the court at P10 indicates through March 23rd of this year, the total attorney's fees uh, incurred by my client totaled $19,214.62. I added to that an additional three hours of my time as an estimate for the preparation and attendance at today's hearing. So that's where I got the total of $20,642.62. In connection with this lawsuit, Judge, I have prepared drafting, excuse me, I have drafted pleadings and orders, conducted legal research, prepared briefing for the court reviewed documents, had numerous conferences with my client, and have prepared for. Uh, I'm going fast. Yeah, you're just you're going, going. Sorry. So let me let me tell you where you left, where 
I left my um, court reporter left off and you can pick up from there. Okay. You said, so that's where I get the total of 20,000 in connection with this lawsuit. Judge, I have prepared, excuse me, I have drafted pleadings and orders, conducted legal research, prepared briefing for the court, reviewed documents, had numerous conferences with my client and opposing counsel, excuse me, not opposing counsel with my client. And I've prepared for and attended two hearings as well as today's trial. I've assigned various tasks to my paralegal as well. Specifically, Judge, I believe that needless attorney's fees were incurred, particularly at the beginning of this case, when I contacted Ms. McKnight in early February as a matter of professional courtesy because she had been the respondent's attorney in the divorce. And I asked if she would be representing him in this matter and if she would accept service on behalf of her client. She responded that she would ask her client, but then she never got back with me. Accordingly, I had to go through weeks of delay and cost, getting citation and notice issued, and getting the respondent served, which was not an easy task. Then, apparently, he had hired Miss McKnight on Monday, February 20th, but they waited to file an answer and contact me until Friday afternoon, February 24th, right before the scheduled temporary orders hearing on February 28th. At that time, on Friday afternoon, uh, Ms. McKnight indicated that she had a conflict on February 28th and that she wanted a continuance. Now, normally, I'm always going to work with opposing counsel to schedule a hearing when everyone is available, but in my opinion, she shouldn't have taken the case knowing there was a hearing set on 228 if she had a conflict on 228. So we had to appear on February 28th with Judge Lee and address her continuance and address the, the concerns that I had about it. Judge Lee did continue it for a couple of weeks and we appeared again in front of her on March 14th and addressed my request for temporary orders. That's also when we appeared before you briefly uh, judge in order to also present some of those arguments. So um, in terms of the motion for sanctions that Ms. McKnight has filed against me and my client, I've submitted briefing to the court that addresses it, but certainly the motion for sanctions uh, wound up my client having to incur additional fees to defend that. The motion for sanctions should be summarily denied. You have to prove it's both groundless and brought in bad faith or for harassment. My, my requests for temporary orders were not groundless when I have case law authority supporting it, which I've briefed to the court, and also was not brought in bad faith or for harassment when I was simply asking the court to preserve the funds that came from the sale of a marital asset that needed to get a, a debt paid that was pursuant to the order. So it's not sanctionable conduct, yet my client had to incur additional fees for me to defend that motion for sanctions. So it's my opinion that the $20,642.62 in fees and costs are both reasonable and necessary in representing my client in this matter, and that the award of such fees to be paid by the respondent is in conformity with the Texas Family Code and the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. Judge, I also have as P11, redacted copies of my uh, billing statements from January through February, and I will offer P11. Objection. Uh, my objection to P11 is that they're over redacted. Even if you uh, admit them, um, it's my objection. They're over redacted. It does not show the work performed in a sufficient way. Um, and under the Ramoose case, it doesn't give an accurate depiction, and I object in that regard. Rumos, R O H M O O S, I believe. Yes. Response, Judge. I don't believe they're overly redacted. You can tell that I'm either having a telephone telephone conference with my client. I'm preparing legal research. I'm preparing documents. Um, I believe that you can certainly. Uh, cross me on it if that's what Miss McKnight's concern is or what the case law indicates. But moreover, I'm also happy to um, produce unredacted copies to the court in camera 
you know, if that's the concern, I have no problem doing that. But obviously, I don't want to be looked at as waiving any, you know, attorney client privileges by um, submitting unredacted or lightly redacted bills. The objection is overruled. P11 is admitted. And then judge on P12, which I have on the screen, is just a draft statement through March 23rd um, that supports the attorney's fee summary I've already given to the court. And I'll offer P12. Objection. Same objection. Overruled. P12 is admitted. And I'll pass myself, judge. Right. Mr. Rowan, how long have you been a family law attorney? Since 2007. Okay, since 2007, how many temporary order hearings have you had on a motion to enforce? I can't think of one. Okay, you can't think of one because it's not authorized under the law and you've never done it, right? Disagree. It's authorized by the case of Jacobs okay. v. Jacobs, which is in evidence. So why do you think in all the years since 2007 you've been practicing family law that you've never had one set against you and you've never set one before? I have no answer to that. Okay. And um, you would agree with me that the court has no authority to modify the decree. There's no question about that, right? Agree. Court can't modify right. the decree. And um, you would agree with me that um, the decree does not provide for the acceleration of the line of credit of 180000 I agree with that. All right. And so, in, so what was the basis, the legal basis for you to request $400,000 to be put in the registry of the court? Under the case of Jacobs v. Jacobs, the court can make temporary orders and issue temporary injunctions in a Chapter 9 enforcement. So I was asking the court to preserve $400,000 from the sale of the marital residence or really any other source of funds such that the bills could be paid that were ordered to be paid, specifically the tax debt for 2021. And we were adding a little bit before interest and penalties were continuing to accrue. So by the time I got to trial, whenever that may have been, that there would be sufficient funds preserved in the registry to get the debt paid. So it's your testimony that you weren't seeking to force him to have to pay off the $180,000 note? Certainly the focus of this entire case and my client- Objection to a non-responsive answer. The same. Can you repeat the question, Lisa? So is it, are you, your testimony that you weren't forcing, trying to force him to pay off in full that $180,000 note? No. All right, well then why, so your pleadings in of itself acknowledge the $200,000 payment to the IRS in January, don't they? Doesn't, I believe, don't they, I believe they do. I believe okay, they do. but yet, so he only owed $175,000 in January when you filed this lawsuit, correct? I, I can't be sure what was owed at the time we filed. The well, how much is owed right now? The evidence that's in before the court shows 175,000 as of March 13th. Okay. And I so it's, he certainly, and, and has that, and so what you asked for exceeded the amount of the IRS due. Would you agree with me on that? To some extent, yes, because we were concerned about interest and penalties continuing to accrue until we got to final trial, which I didn't know when that would be. All right. And, and part of the relief that you were seeking was you were seeking that he not be able to spend any money whatsoever from any source except to pay the line of credit and the IRS. Isn't that the relief you were seeking? That was one of the temporary injunctions we okay. were seeking. And have you ever heard of anybody getting that type of relief on a motion to enforce? I don't know what you mean by heard of. Well, have you ever seen it in a CLE? I can't pretend to have gone to all the CLE in the state well, of Texas. Well, I'm just asking you if you've ever seen it before. Ever seen it before? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that question means. I'm going to have to say I don't well, know. Well, have you ever read about it or saw um, other than this one case that you cite that's not on point, have you ever saw any presentation about, hey, look at this remedy available. You can get a temporary order on a motion to enforce. I can't think of a CLE that I have attended that I can recall that specifically said that, counsel. However, the case of Jacobs v. Jacobs is not- Objection to non-responsive at this point. I'm, I'm responding to the question, and I object to your characterization of the case is not on point. Okay, Attorney McKnight, move on to your next right. question. Now, um, how much have you been paid? I've, I believe it's, I, my answer is I don't know. 
All right. And um, would you agree with me that if you had not had the requested relief for the injunction, that we would not have had to do briefing in this case? Oh, I don't agree with that. Do you think we would have had, if you hadn't had all of that temporary relief requested, do you think the judge would have asked us to brief this case? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, if you hadn't had all your requests for temporary orders on this uh, motion to force, we wouldn't, we would not have had two hearings that we had to have. Would you agree with that? I don't agree with that either. And let me well, clarify one of my answers. I actually think that Judge Bailey, when I asked what kind of briefing, what she wanted the briefing to cover, she said everything. So I want to correct my answer that I think we would have had to brief either way because she indicated she wanted briefing on all issues. So why didn't you, when you filed your motion to enforce, you know, um, why didn't you just set it for a final hearing and serve him with a final hearing like that? I don't know how to answer that question. That that goes into attorney client privileged information between me and my client. I'm not going to I'm not going to reveal the substances of our conversations and our strategy. Well, you would agree and um, that but for your request for temporary orders and a temporary injunction, we would not have had to have two uh, we would not have had to have any hearings in front of Jean Lee. Would you agree with that? I, I can't say that, counselor. There could have been discovery issues. There could have been any number of things that could have arisen that required hearings in front of Judge Lee. And if you had immediately back in January when you filed this, went ahead and set it for a final hearing, give him notice, we wouldn't have had to answer discovery because it would have been the no disclosures would have been due. Right. I don't agree with that. And you wouldn't agree to reset the temporary orders unless my client put $200,000 into the registry of the court. Isn't that correct? That was something I asked. Objection. I said, and, and so we had to have a hearing on my motion for continuance. Is that correct? I'd like to answer the question in full that you asked me before. So I'll object and ask the court to allow me to answer that. The court will allow you to answer. Do you remember the question? I do. I do. So. Counselor, when you asked me for a continuance because you had a conflict on 228, I said I would be happy to agree to a continuance if your client could put the funds into the registry of the court so we could at least preserve the money and then go have a hearing. So that is that's the represent. Slow down. I'm Slow sorry. Down. I'm okay. sorry. So it's accurate for me to say you would not agree to a continuance unless he put $200,000 into the registry of the court. That's accurate, right? Yes. Okay. And um, you agree with me that the law, with the law that says basically if something says timely, it's not enforceable and must be clarified. Do you agree with that? I agree that there's a case, the Hollingsworth case, that indicated the word timely in terms of paying a tax debt is not enforceable by contempt. It's not specific enough to be enforceable by contempt. And you cited that case in your brief. It's a Dallas Court of Appeals case. Is that correct? I did. All right. And so the relief available for you in this case with respect to the taxes would be to clarify the order and getting a date certain on which to pay the taxes. Correct? I agree on the final trial. That is what I can request and that is what I have requested. All right. And the relief with respect to the line of credit um, the relief available to you with respect to that is to clarify that, yes, this is the debt belonging to his practice and he owes that debt. That's one of the things that I've requested as well as the signing of a release. Okay. And when did you send me the release you wanted signed? I sent it this morning. Okay. And um, so really, isn't it true that the relief that you've been seeking is that he have to pay that note in full? I have that as a request in my pleadings, but that's not something I've asked the judge to order today. All but right. It's in my pleadings. Because you're aware that that is not authorized under the law, correct? I don't know whether or not it's it's authorized or not. Again, based on conversations between me and my client, which are privileged and private, we are asking the judge today to order it paid, or excuse me, to confirm that it's ordered to be paid and to sign the release. So, uh, so you admit that you tried to get funds from him be ordered to be put in the registry of the court to collect an unsecured debt that is not due. 
No, I acknowledge that. No, I don't. I've said that more than once. I don't agree with that statement, counselor. So what was the purpose of the 400,000? To secure the tax debt, including interest and penalties that may continue to accrue. Okay, so we've already established that the tax debt at the time you filed this lawsuit was $175,000 or less, correct? I said I wasn't sure what it was due, what was due at the time that I filed the lawsuit. That was my testimony. Well, in in your pleadings, you would acknowledge a $200,000 payment, right? I believe it does. And in your exhibit, there was an exhibit saying there was 300 and something thousand owed, correct? Whatever the exhibit says is what it says. Right. So you knew or should have known that the tax, the amount of taxes due were less than $200,000, right? I don't know what was due at the time I filed the petition for divorce. I've said that three times now. I don't know with certainty what was due at the time I filed the petition. Well, then will you, would you agree with me that trying to get somebody to pay in full, an unsecured note into the registry of the court is not authorized by law? My answer is, I don't know. That's the second time I've given that answer. So I'm going to object at this point to ask and answer. I'll pass the witness. I have nothing further, Judge. Okay. All right. Attorney McKnight. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Attorney Rowan, do you rest? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Attorney McKnight? Yes. I'll call myself as to attorney's fees. Okay. You may proceed. All right. Um, um, my name is Lisa McKnight. I'm an attorney licensed to practice the, in the state of Texas since 1992. Um, Respondents exhibit number three is my curriculum vitae. Any objection? And I offer respondents exhibit number three. No objection. All right. Um, I am the past president of the family law section of the Dallas Bar. I've been board certified and recertified every five years. I mean, Attorney McKnight, I muted you. I need your attention. I didn't get to admit your exhibit. You spoke too fast. Respondents exhibit three is admitted. OK, now you may begin to speak. Now you can unmute. All right. Um, I've been board certified and recertified every five years since 1998 in family law. I'm the past president of the family law section of the Dallas Bar. Um, I was hired by Dr. Kirby to represent him in this case. He signed a retainer letter um, I and paid me $5,000 on February 7th of 2023. I would offer respondents exhibit number four is my retainer letter executed by Dr. Kirby. Any objection? No, ma'am. Respondents exhibit four is immediate. I, um, where's my, Respondents exhibit number two is a, hold on a second, is my summary, the summary of my testimony regarding my fees. Hold on, I'm looking for mine. Let me start with respondents exhibit number five is my invoices in this case. I'm the custodian of these records. Um, they're unredacted and um, they represent the work that I and my legal staff have completed on this case. And I would offer respondents exhibit number five. Objection. I have none. Respondents exhibit five is admitted. All right. Now, um, respond and respondents exhibit number two is a summary based on the um, fees the invoice fees that are admitted, and it summarizes the amount of hours that I worked, paralegals worked, estimated future for this trial and finalization, um, total fees paid, and, and I broke down the amount for the sanctions. I would offer responses exhibit number two. Objection. I'm sorry, Judge. Let me just look at it real quick. This is exhibit two. Mm -hmm. My only objection, Judge, is the reference to total sanction fees. It, I mean, if she wants to tell us what her attorney's fees incurred have been, so be it. But I object to the word sanctions in there. Okay. Objection overrule. Respondents exhibit, I believe this is five. No, two. Two. Respondents exhibit two is admitted as a summary. 
And um, with respect to respondents exhibit number five, which is already in evidence, I went through my billing and I put the word sanctions by every single time entry that was necessary due to her request for temporary orders and a temporary injunction in this case. I put her on notice early and often that this was not a relief available. I did it in writing. I did it orally. Um, I filed an objection to the hearing. She never got that temporary relief granted. Um, she's admitted that she's never seen it before. And the, the reason she's never seen it before because it's not legal. And it is my testimony that it was done for the purpose of harassing him, trying to force him to do something that he's not legally obligated to do. Um, the court can certainly clarify the order. The court can order a date certain. The court can clarify the line of credit. That was not what they wanted you to do. What they wanted was a temporary injunction for Gene Lee to order him to put 400 grand into the registry of the court to force him to pay a debt that wasn't due, that's unsecured. That's wrong. Instead of backing off, she kept doubling down on it and I had to go to court twice over this issue. And that relief was never granted. And I'm asking the court at bare minimum, she needs to pay her own attorney's fees for this. Um, this was unnecessarily escalated by an, a request that is not a valid legal request. It was not to advance the law. It's for the purpose of bullying and harassing my client. So um, in addition, Um, I'm familiar with the fees customary charge in Dallas and contiguous counties. I charge $525 an hour, which I believe is a reasonable rate for my attorney's fees. Um, I also have paralegals time in my um, uh, billing. Um, my paralegal, Brenda, is board certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization as a paralegal in family law. She has a degree and she's been doing it for over 20 years, she charges $240 an hour. My lowest paid paralegal charges $90 an hour. Um, that work is supervised by me. The tasks are one that are traditionally done by an attorney. The services were reasonable and necessary. Um, I've submitted the specifically hourly rate and the numbers charged in my unredacted billing. Um, and I pass myself. Okay. Cross. Thank you, Judge. Um, pursuant to the exhibit you just put into evidence, Ms. McKnight, uh, your client hired you on February 7th of 2023. Is that correct? Well, that's what the date of the retainer letter was sent to him. He didn't sign it until March, but I don't, I don't know exactly what, when he paid is when he hired. The date of the retainer letter is the date he was sent the re retainer letter. Okay. So you had at least started some communications with him by February 7th of 2023, such that you sent him a retainer letter. Yes. And in fact, the first time entry on your bills is dated February 7th of 2023, correct? Probably, if you say so, there it is. Yeah. Okay. And do you recall me emailing you on January 27th of 2023, asking you if you were going to be representing Dr. Kirby? Yes. And you wrote me back and said, I'll get in touch with Dr. Kirby and ask. Do you recall that? Yes. And so then within a week's time, you had had some kind of conversation with him where you were sending him a fee contract and a time entry was made, right? Well, the time entry was probably to open a file. It wasn't made by me. I can let me double check it. But probably. Okay. So within a week of me asking you if you were going to be representing him, you had been in contact with him and sent him a fee contract. Yes. Well, I don't know if that's a week within, I'll take your word for it when you emailed me, but uh, I, want, I can't go into what my client said and what I had to talk to him about. I'm not asking you that question. I'm sharing my screen. So that yes, you... February 27th to the 7th is 10 days, not a week. Okay. 11 days. Can you see my screen, ma'am? I'm looking at January 27th. Okay. So on January 27th, I asked you if you were going to be representing him. And, and I responded back that day. Yeah. Excuse me. And within 10 days, you were in touch with Dr. Kirby and sending him a fee contract. Is that correct? Yes. 
And then instead of agreeing to accept service on his behalf, you never responded again to this email. And we had to go through the cost and the time to get him personally served, correct? I, you, I, you had to do what you had to do. And then even though you had sent him a fee contract on February 7th, you did not appear in this matter until two business days before the temporary orders hearing on March 20th, correct? If you say so, I don't dispute that. What was the attorney Rowan, attorney McKnight, you know, those responses are inappropriate. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the document in front of me. Okay. Well then the appropriate response is, I don't know. I don't have the document okay. in front of me. Okay. You may continue. So Ms. McKnight, do you, do you acknowledge that you did not appear in this case until March 20th? I don't know. I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Um, do you have any reason to disbelieve that I'm telling you that your answer was filed on March 20th? No. Okay. So if we assume that that's accurate and you didn't appear until March 20th, that was two business days before our temporary orders hearing. Isn't that correct? I don't know. I don't have that document in front of me. Okay. And I'm so sorry. You didn't appear until March 24th, the Friday afternoon before the weekend and our temporary orders hearing was Tuesday. Isn't that right? You know what? Since I may, you want me to look myself? Because you're changing that on me. When you say appear, follow the answer. Yes, ma'am. I answered on 224. You mean 324? No, 224. No, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. So you appeared, you filed your answer on 224 and our hearing was the very next Tuesday on 228. Correct. I don't know that. And now I, I, I don't know that I can look if you want me to. I'd just like an answer to my question. You filed your answer on 224, and we had a temporary orders hearing scheduled two business days later on 228. Isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. Even though you had sent him a fee contract on February 7th. Objection to ask and answer. Now you indicated that my temporary orders- Y'all move judge, I'm sorry. Attorney Rowan, what kind of contract? We didn't get the last of your question. Sure, but you did not, uh, but you had sent him a fee contract on 2-7. Um, Ms. McKnight, you indicated that my temporary orders request had not been granted, but isn't it correct they'd also not been denied? Correct. And isn't it true when we were in front of Judge Lee two weeks ago, that she indicated that she thought both sides were right. Do you recall her saying that? That's not the way I heard it. Do you and recall her she saying- She refused to hear your relief. Objection, non-responsive. I'm so sorry, Judge, you were on mute, so I didn't hear the ruling. Sustained. I, I'm just trying to make sure you all don't get the background noise. Um, Ms. McKnight, isn't it true that Judge Lee said two weeks ago that she thought she had the power to grant the temporary to orders request that I was requesting? Attorney McKnight didn't finish the question. Attorney Rowan, go ahead and finish your question. Isn't it true, Ms. McKnight, when we were in front of Judge Lee two weeks ago, she indicated that she thought she had the power to grant the temporary orders request that I was requesting? Objection to hearsay. Overrule, you may answer the question. That's not exactly what she said, no. Did she say words to that effect, Ms. McKnight? No, she said, I don't know if I do, maybe I do, something to that effect. She said for sure she knew she couldn't do something, but she didn't know if she could do the other one. And I'll, I'll object to non-responsive. 
sustain. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Attorney McKnight. Um, this, in redirecting myself, this should have been a $5,000 enforcement case. That would have been reasonable. She escalated it in asking for something that she's never asked before, that she's never seen before, that's not authorized by law. And so is this closing statement or attorney's fees testimony? I'm going to object to the, the pur purported attorney's fees testimony. Attorney McKnight, this is still, you're, you just said it, you're redirecting yourself. So we're still on the track. Yes, yes. And the, ex the ex fees that my client had to incur in the unreasonable request exceed the fees that she had to incur in her, un in her reasonable request. And in my opinion, she is not the prevailing party um, in that her, the focus of what she was trying to do never got granted. And the relief that you're going to grant today is not really the relief she was looking for. And I passed myself. Okay. Do you rest as well? Yes, ma'am. Both sides closed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I just need some clarification on a couple of things. The... IRS debt as of March 13th, that amount was $175,000? Yes. Okay. There's, the, I think there's more on it, like some sense to that, but let me tell you. Okay. So, Judge. 261.92, 175.261.92. And, Judge, the concern is where we're pulling that number from. It specifically says this is not a payoff amount. So I don't know that anyone can testify or tell you accurately what the payoff amount is. So that's why in my requested relief, I'm simply saying whatever the total is, including interest, taxes, penalties, we want all of that paid. Okay. And I understand. I'm just trying to get a roundabout estimate sure. because I did see the exhibit about the interest and penalties accruing. So I understand. That. But thank you both for clearing that up. The PNC, roughly how much is left on that? 180,000. Attorney McKnight, your client asked for, you were asking your client during testimony about how much time did he needed to pay. Was he saying he needed 90 days to pay both of those amounts? No. Or of the other just for the irs like he if he came back to you in 90 days he would have the irs paid in full okay it is not his intention to pay the line of credit in full nor is it his obligation okay nor is it the relief that they're requesting today okay thank you and just so we're clear the release has been signed by the respondent yes attorney rowan you have a copy of their release i do not okay Attorney McKnight, will you tender a copy of the release to yes. Attorney Rowan today? Yes. yes. Brenda, email her the release right now, please. And to the judge. Thank you. I'm, e I'm emailing a notarized, the notarized release to everybody right now. Okay. And attorney's fees, as of today, when you add in the additional time, it's $20,642.62? Yes, ma'am. All right. And attorney McKnight, what was your amount for today? Um, all right. Hold on. It is. Let me get that. It's 19,000 something, but I'm going to give you the exact amount. Um, the total is. Oh, excuse me. 17,000. $492.75, $13,256 of which were attributable to the sanctions. $13,256. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Mr. Kirby, Ms. Kirby, again, I want to reiterate to you, I, I, and I think this is very important for me to say, like I told you all last time, you all have, you both have great attorneys. They did an amazing job today. So I just wanted to make sure that I reiterate that to you. Thank both of you for presenting your case today. You did an amazing job. The court will have a ruling to you, if not later on today, no later than tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. May we be excused? Yes, you're a right. student.
right now. Oh, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone here, like I'm staring at the face of a cover-up. That's offensive. Well, I'll make sure to pass on how offended you are to his other victims. Facts were disputed in some of his surgeries here. Surgeries? Yeah, I saw one of his air quote surgeries here firsthand. And yet somehow I got the curve. Yeah, I didn't receive your complaint. Our letter for Dr. Dutch.